Let's go to our Lord in prayer before we get to verse 11 and verse 12. Father, your word is holy. Your word is divine. You are the word revealed to us. Father, in this precious book, and specifically in this book of James, there are 53 commands for us as your children. 53 commands to walk straight according to your truth. These are not just challenges, these are commands. These are not optional. So, Father, I pray as these tests are revealed to us that we will be found faithful in not only passing the test, but faithful in living according to your truth and your word. Father, thank you for the example that you lived. Thank you for the love that you gave us as you gave yourself at Calvary for us that we can live. May we honor you here, Lord Jesus. And it's in your holy name that we pray, and for your glory. Amen. 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 Well, despite our seemingly casual attitude towards slander, it's a very destructive sin. So slander not only strikes at people's dignity, but it also defames their character, and it literally destroys the reputation. And according to the Bible, your, reputa your reputation is the most precious, priceless, worldly asset that you have. This is what Proverbs 22.1 reminds us of. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. Your name is something that's very precious. It's what you have on this earth that's priceless. So not only is slandering a devastating sin, but it's a universal sin. Not just some people commit it. It seems that the whole world commits it. And since slander is so easy to commit because it is so widespread and almost inescapable, the Bible has a lot to say about it. In fact, the Bible denounces the sin of slandering God and slandering men. So don't think that, well, I'm not guilty of slandering God. Well, if you are not slandering God but still slandering men, it's still a sin. And it is addressed more than any other sin in the Bible. That is massive. And how casual we take it. Just for example of this atrocious sin, Jeremiah 6.28 says, They are all stubborn rebels, walking as slanderers. They are bronze and iron. They are all Corrupters. It's a hard word to say. Romans 128, Paul even describes the condition of mankind before the return of Christ. And we all think that Christ is about to return, right? Well, this is the condition of mankind that Paul wrote this many years ago, Romans 128. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. What, what things were, not, were they doing that were not fitting? Well, Paul goes on to tell us exactly what he means by this. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, that is slander, backbiters, 
slander, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. That's quite a list. And it doesn't take long to see that that is the condition of the world that we live in. You simply just have to turn on the evening news and you can see it. So slandering, it is the mark of the wicked. Slandering is the mark of the unregenerate. Slandering is the mark of the unbeliever. So slander is deadly. Slander is dangerous. Slander is devastating. And as we mentioned last week, slander originated in the Garden of Eden, perpetrated by the devil himself. You can look at that scripture found in Genesis chapter 3. So slander is very serious. It's a very serious sin. And I want to show you that it's not only a serious sin to God, but he not only hates it, but he will judge it. We find this in Proverbs 6.16. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who dis sows discord among brethren. You see that one of the top seven things that God literally hates and will judge is slander. Now to our text, James chapter 4, starting in verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver. You notice that that word is capitalized with a capital L speaking of God. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? We mentioned last week, and we started with the first item, and we'll cover those in just a moment. The phrase, do not speak evil, is translated from the Greek word, kataloleo. Catalileo only appears here and also in 1 Peter. And I read these scriptures to you last week to show you how that word catalileo is mentioned and used in those scriptures. 1 Peter 2.12 saying, Have, Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evil doers. That phrase is catalileo. Malicious speaking that may they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. The next time it's mentioned is 1 Peter 3.16. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, that's the phrase catalileo, that's where that word comes from. Those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So catalileo carries the idea here, and you can see in those just those couple verses of speaking with a malicious intent, a desire to do harm with words. Sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you, right? Wrong. They tear you to pieces. So along with the related noun, kataleia, it's translated slander, this kataleo and kataleia, it refers to this mindless, thoughtless, 
careless, critical, derogatory, untrue speech that's directed against other people. But you think, don't people deserve to be lashed at? Don't people deserve to be cursed and malicious, maliciously aligned? Don't they just I mean, they're evil people out there. I'm sure that whatever speech that you give them, whatever malicious intent that you have, they deserve to be cut. They deserve these things. James has just shown us that the mark of a true believer is humility. You see this in verse 10? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Are you in a humble state when you're maliciously attacking somebody with words? So in verses 11 and 12, James reveals to us how humility is violated and how pride is revealed. And how do we violate our humility? By defaming other people. You're not humble when you're defaming somebody. And that's not a mark of a believer. So being filled and led by God's Holy Spirit, James says that a person's life who's characterized by habitual slander, habitual condemnation of others, all it does is it reveals an evil, unregenerate heart. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes the situation you're in, it slips. I, look, I can't say that sometime this week somebody hasn't frustrated me so much where I blurted out something that shouldn't have been said or the way I should have said it. We slip that way, but you know, there's an immediate response when God's Spirit says, David, 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 that's not the way you talk. And there's this crawling back into my little hole. Father, forgive me, I didn't. That's not who I am. That's not what we're, we're talking about here. We're talking about in every situation, all the time, desiring to maliciously align somebody to give them what they deserve. If that's your habitual attitude, if that's your habitual slandering, condemning attitude, you are revealing to the world that you have an evil, unregenerate heart. Their mouths become a tunnel to which depravity exits their heart. It's a constant flow of blurting out vicious language. But on the other hand, sanctified speech marks a true believer. We've talked about the tongue. James has already covered that area in chapter 3. So the issue of slander becomes another test, doesn't it? Another test of genuine salvation. But for, for the believer, it's a, just a measure of their spiritual growth, their spiritual maturity, how you talk. So to help us control our tongues, not that any of us need any help or control in this area, but if you happen to be one of the few minority that doesn't have things under control, this is for you. To avoid slander, James exhorts us to examine the way we think. He's already attacked us on how we're supposed to act. Now we got to really absorb how we think and how we respond. We talked about this, this the first one last week, what we think of others. So we looked at James 4.11, the first part of it, where it says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother. Remember that threefold repetition in that verse, talking about brethren, brother, and brother. We're talking about family relationships. It reminds us, this family, family relationship that we share as, as Christians. 
So slander is obviously an antithesis of what's expected and acceptable in a family relationship. What types are we a behavior we expected to produce in a family relationship? Love, support, protection. This is just a beginning. Can expect to receive slander from people outside the church. But slander within the church? Absolutely unacceptable. That's what James says. So the second area of our thinking that we have to carefully examine is what we think of the law. And if you're anything like me, immediately you're thinking the law, the law. I'm not under the law, am I? James 4.11, the last part of that verse speaks evil of the law, judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. Loving others is a personification of the law. Slander is failing to love others. So slander is a Violation of the law. Isn't it? That's the way James is clearly stating here. Paul even says this in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. I owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. So obviously, if you don't love one another and you show that by slandering them that you don't love them, you've violated the law. Am I misunderstanding something? So the law is love ordered. The law is the expression of how to love other people. That's the way it's laid out. Jesus even says this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one Tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Jesus came to fulfill the law by showing us how to love one another. Well, that just blew your and my expe expectation out of what the law is. Thought I wasn't under it. Well, I'm not judged by it, but I still have to live by it. Well, a careful examination, if you've noticed on your notes, you're thinking, what is David bringing the Ten Commandments in here for? Well, a really careful examination of the Ten Commandments reveals how the law is ten features of love verbalized. The first commandment, Exodus 23, verse 3 rather, you shall have no other gods before me, well, that shows that love is not, it's not fickle. It's not unloyal. It's devoted. It's single-minded. It's loving God more than anything else and only Him. Isn't that what this is showing us? You shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who 
hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my what? Commandments. Keeping commandments is what we're required to do. It's a further description of love's faithfulness. Love is not only loyal in attitude, but faithful in practice. I am to live out, I am to follow the commandments of God, the law of God. We get this distorted look of the law because the Pharisees just shred it to pieces. That's not what the law was. They're the ones that came up with all of these extra laws that Jesus said, that's not, the, that's not the law. It's your own devices of how you think that you can be holy. God didn't command people to live by that. Third commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Love is to be respected. Respected toward God. Specifically, the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's a description of love's intimacy with our devotion to God. Yes, we're not, we're not Jewish. I, I got that. We don't meet on a Saturday, which is the first day of the week. We meet on a Sunday because that's when Christ came and was, he rose from the, from the grave. We gather together and we worship on a Sunday. But this is our love to him, our intimacy, our devotion to him. The law describes it. The fifth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Love is described as being submissive to authority. Here it's represented by parental authority, but ultimately our complete submission is to be to God. It just shows us that we have parents and we're supposed to honor them. Well, Jesus also states, if you think, well, you know, my parents are not here, states that Christians are to be submissive to one another. He says this in Ephesians 5.21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You can't get out of this. There's someone always around you. You'll be, to, to be submissive to them. We are servants on this earth. The sixth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Well, you say, Whew. I hadn't killed anyone, at least not yet. Well, this expresses the value love places on other people. In the New Testament, Jesus reveals that the true intent of this commandment was not merely to prohibit killing someone physically, actual murder, but the actual anger that leads to murder. Taking every thought captive, you know, because you, where does sin start? Right up here. And it moves right on down. It's taking the information and becoming angry in your heart against it. That's what he says in Matthew 5, 21. You, shall, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whatever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. It's very little said about the physical murder. He just went on with this thing with the issue with anger that can lead to murder. Well, Raka comes from the Aramaic term recall. And recall was a derogatory expression meaning empty-minded, empty-headed. It's talking about a person's stupidity or inferior, inferior, inferiority. He's saying that you're less than I am. It was an offensive name. And it was used to show this utter contempt about another person. Building yourself up to make someone else look stupid. I says, you don't do that. And you can see that Jesus 
warned that the use of such of a word as raka to describe someone was as good as murder and deserved the severest punishment of the law. It's about a hard issue, isn't it? Seventh commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Well, this shows love both to be pure and to desire purity in its object. Purity. Love would never defile another person because we are to love one another. You don't defile them because of your own perverted fantasies. The Eighth Commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, you shall not steal. This manifests the unselfish nature of love. Love seeks to give, not to take. The Ninth Commandment, Exodus 20, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Well, that just said something about slander, didn't it? Lying against them, maliciously aligning them. But this shows love's truthfulness. Love would never lie against or about someone. They want the truth to be known, not lying to get their way. The, te the tenth commandment, the final commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So the final expression of love is shown by unselfish contentment. I have what I have because God gave that to me. So love is content with what it has. Tab's trying to teach me this lesson. Wishes only the best for others. You have it? Good for you. Instead of saying, oh, I sure wish I had that. It's sin. So can you see why the Ten Commandments are the law is just an articulation of the principles of love? Law is about showing me how to love not only God, but other people. You know, when Jesus was asked to name the greatest of all commandments in the law, you remember what he said? Remember how he replied this, Matthew 22, 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then he didn't leave it at that. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything hangs on love. So God gave his law to regulate people's love, not only for him, but for other people. So, back to our scripture, James doesn't condemn slander only as a violation of personal affection, or just as this basic human kindness He's condemning it because it's a violation of God's holy law. Then again, David, most people are really hard to deal with. I've made the joke before, this world would be a great place to live if it didn't have people. But it does. And most people don't deserve to be loved. I know at least in my eyes. But listen to what Jesus says about that. Luke 6.32 But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. 
And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, for just as your Father also is merciful. Well, that stung. So let's read our passage again. James 4.11 do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. So since slander is a violation of the law of love, as we have clearly established by God's word, right church? A slanderer speaks against the law. Thus showing an utter disregard for God's divine standards. If you choose to slander, because we all have a choice about what we say, you are saying, I disregard what God has put in place for me to follow. It's utter rebellion. How else do you define it? So if you place yourself above God's law, the warning is this. If you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. You see that implication here, right? The person who disregards God's law is in effect claiming to be superior to the law of God. Which means that if I'm not bound to him. I'm not bound to or subject to God's authority. I am above God. That's what you're saying. That's what the implication is. If you're not a doer, you're just a judge, then you're saying that you go above what I have said what the law is. And the law is love. So it's by this type of disrespect, the sinner judges the law as being unworthy of his attention, unworthy of his affection, unworthy of his obedience, unworthy of his submission. And by the way, all of that, if that is your claim, you are blaspheming God. David, that's kind of hard. How else do we say it? If I choose to do something that God has warned me of, I have chosen to be the judge. It's a heavy load to bear, isn't it, church? Now, do you think that slander is a light sin? No. So how do we respond to this warning? There's got to be some type of response. Because I know that if you're Anything like me, you've done something, said something throughout the week, if not even the day, that has been hurtful or slanderous. Well, in order for me to experience and you to experience victory over slander, it requires us to take a proper place under the law's authority. We have to be submissive. When we sin, we sin against God. When we slander, ultimately we're slandering against God. His will for me is not to do harm, but to bring people into the kingdom. Do you, in your mind, think that you can slander someone in hopes of bringing them into the kingdom. 
What does slander do? It pushes people away. You've done harm. You've rebelled. So is it, is it possible that we can control our tongues? We can control our thoughts. Because God says that I can take every thought into captivity. Do you know that if an evil thought comes into your mind, that's not sin. It's what you do with it that becomes sin. That's why he gives us the command. Take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have a choice how you act. You have a choice by what you say. James says this is a very serious sin. And if it's a repetitive, if this is the character of who you are, your life, your spiritual life may be at stake. So are you guilty of slandering? Repent, confess your sins before God. God is faithful to those that call upon Him. Faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's your responsibility. If you're okay with what you're doing, I'm saying to you, you're in danger of blaspheming God and His holy law. Because if you think that you're not doing anything wrong, and you are, you have become the judge. He's clearly told us what we are to do. Folks, if we're going to win people to Christ in this world, we have to be vastly different than they are. That the, the, the difference between light and darkness and you are to shine. It's a big one, but he's not done yet. Father, we love you. We thank you that you have called us from darkness into light. We are, as your people, in your heavenly kingdom seated at the right hand of the Father. Spiritually speaking, we are already there. But we have a lot of work to do here. We still have that old nature that absorbs our attention, our thinking, our actions, and as new creations, we have a choice to whether to die to that or we have a choice to pick it up. And if we are new creations, we are to choose righteousness rather than sin. You have given us the power over sin. Father, we love you, and we desire that we live lives that bring you honor. Live as examples of your grace and love in this world. You were vastly different than anyone in this world. And now, with your Spirit in us, so are we. Help us to walk in that truth. I pray that we honor you, Lord, in our actions, in our speech, in our thoughts. Thank you for loving us that way. And thank you for giving us the power over sin. And it's for your honor and for your glory that we pray these things. Lord Jesus, amen. Amen.